everyone. Welcome to Hardware IO webinar. Uh, today we'll talk about the reverse engineering embedded systems. So embedded systems are growing increasingly complex and connected and reverse engineering the PCBs, its uh, components and their connections are the essential first step in analyzing the security of a system. And this talk highlights uh, what piece of information we can get and how we can automate uh, dealing with that information to assess the security of embedded systems quickly. And today, Ferdinand uh, will uh, present uh, his talk on this topic. He has been uh, very passionate about information security ever since he was young. And uh, hardware security is a big field of interest for him. Uh, in the past, he, was, uh, he has been working with uh, Xavier in uh, numerous embedded security projects and together they presented the Ken Badger, a uh, novel automotive, uh, automotive hacking tool at the Black Hat and DEFCON 2016. And also uh, he and Javier has been conducting a um, low level hardware reversion training at Hardware IO uh, for, the, for the past couple of years. So uh, uh, Fergie, welcome back to Hardware I. Really nice to have you uh, back with us. And uh, the presentation will take uh, for around uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then it will be followed by a live Q&A session for around 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, you can send them in the chat. Uh, you can send them either uh, publicly or directly to Ferdi in the chat, and then after his presentation, he will answer them. So now, Ferdi, now it's uh, stage is yours. Please, you can start presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Henrik Ferdinand Nerscher, and uh, thank you, Yulia, for this great introduction. Um, yeah, it's good to be here today, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, now, we're here today to talk about um, to talk about analyzing systems the smart way. Now, um, first off, a few words about myself. Um, I'm a security expert, and I've been doing embedded securities Basically, since 2014, I mostly work on, um, you know, low-level systems, reversing a bit of firmware engineering and many automotive projects. Um, I currently work at Nurture Consulting GmbH, and we are based in Ulm, Germany, and we focus on the most challenging aspects of embedded security. Now, in this talk, um, basically, it's it's. I've always found it hard to find common denominators between embedded systems, because if, if you work on a lot of penetration testing for embedded systems, for example, then um, you will agree that there's uh, many components and many different types of architectures. And basically for every systems, there's millions of other ways on how to design a system. And uh, that doesn't necessarily make it easy for us as analysts or uh, as attackers. Right? Um, now, what this boils down to is that when you get a product that you want to test, um, you, you will first off take it down, you, know, you, you get excited, you um, remove all the screws, you take it apart um, and expose the PCBs or multiple PCBs that make up the system. And um, we'll focus on these PCBs because um, I think I haven't seen an embedded system that's not using some kind of uh, circuit board yet. So um, th this is what the first thing that you'll be looking at when you test the system. Um, of course, you clean it up, you disconnect everything, you maybe take some pictures in the process already and uh, you see uh, how is the system built, right? Because that's the question that we want to answer um, before we can draw any conclusions on how the system um, is vulnerable or can be tested, we need to sort of understand how it works. Um, so after looking and tearing down all, all, all of the pieces of the system, you would identify components on the PCB. Now this is really nice because um, in almost all cases, the PCB uh, components are mounted on the back or the front side of the PCB. So there you'll find your chips and um, if you're like me and you're excited you will you know note down any part numbers and start googling them try to look for information and um, note it down um, also what's important is that i think everyone already sort of uh, has a gut feeling on which components are uh, important so um, 
for us as an attacker, it's not really um, of interest to see how did they design a power supply, right? That's most likely to be uninteresting. That's something we can ignore. We care about the components that run code or store data. Um, and then this is what you'll be looking at first. You'll immediately decide what uh, components you can ignore. Now, once you've done that, you would gather information. Again, you, you Google the part numbers, uh, you download anything you can find, and basically you still try to figure out what are the crucial components that make up the system. And uh, when I talk about components, I talk about the integrated circuits um, that are soldered on the, on the circuit board. And, and basically what you do in this step, you you map functions to individual components saying like, this is a processor, this will be executing code and interfacing with other components, right? And then you can sort of think about um, how the designers of that system um, achieve the system's function. Um, and once you did that, um, of course, this is where the fun part begins. Um, you dump reverse exploit and uh, you know how this goes. There's many other talks about this. But in this presentation, we'll be covering step two and three. So we will have a thorough look at what information do we have available? Um, what are the, some of the challenges that we have during this step and how can we structure this a little bit more so that we um, spend less time in these steps and be more thorough. So a lot of this um, might, you know, and, and we'll be using, you know, automated techniques to for example, search for data sheets and all that. It's not, it's gonna save you some time if you're dealing with big systems, but even if you're dealing with small systems, um, maybe just like three or four active components, um, this can be very useful because it enhances the quality of, of your tests. It basically, uh, we, we don't like guessing things, we want to know things, right? So having more information is always good. Um, yeah, and often in, during these phases, you overlook some things. Like when I was working at, and, and tearing down an, an automotive product a couple of years ago, um, I immediately spotted the microcontroller and, and tried to look for a debugging port and all that. But um, what I, and I, I spent weeks, right, trying to open the debugging port because it's secure, blah, blah, blah. It, it can be painful. But then what I didn't notice was that there's this teeny tiny from on the other side of the PCB. And uh, if I had, you know, done my, uh, you know, my step two and three correctly, then um, I, I could have spotted it, dumped it. And actually there was a flag that would enable some debugging functions. And uh, this could have saved a lot of time. So uh, it doesn't have to be like that always, of course, but um, we, we basically also want to avoid switching back and forth because once you maybe dump some foam where you want to see, oh, okay, there, there seems to be any from, let's look where it is. And then you have to trace which components could it be on the PCB. You have to go back and forth between your lab bench and your computer. And um, that is also something that I don't like much. So uh, yeah, of course, when you have big projects, with more than 20 components, this can also be very uh, time consuming. So all, overall, it would be nice if we could automate some steps of this and um, solve some challenges as well, because if you did this a couple of times, you know that whatever it says on the chip doesn't necessarily mean or represent a, a part number that is actually an orderable part number. Um, many times they use some kind of scheme to label their components and um, it's not always that obvious on what that maps to. Um, yeah, and, and of course it's boring, right? We, we want to have shells, we want to dump things, we want to solder, we don't want to try and read um, part numbers. Now, remember our goal is to have fun. We want to dump, temper, extract, we want to find parts. Um, because of that, we care about the active components. When I say active components, I mean everything that is able to change its digital state actively, you know, something that processes signals or generates signals. Um, passives would be resistors, capacitors, like usually those are not that important, um, at least in this initial state. Um, and then that's also something we can ignore. It's more distracting than it's useful. Um, and as I said, we want to get as much information as possible, um, not only for component 
identification or to know what we're dealing with, but also for later on when we reverse firmware, we want to have memory maps, we want to, um, you know, um, we want to maybe have a compiler to, um, to generate um, to generate function signatures and all that. So how do we actually do that? Um, well, yeah, and it's important to note that we don't care about the physical layout. Uh, we, first off, the schematic is fine. We want to reconstruct the schematic and see what component talks to which other component. And um, that way we figure out how the system works. Our approach, um, and this has been uh, published in, in a different format a couple of years ago, and we, ever since we find it and have been working on it. Um, basically, our process is that we take high resolution images of the front and back of the PCB. And uh, using these images, we start detecting components. Um, then once we detect components, we try to read the part numbers and then um, in an automated way, look up any kind of information that we get. Um, so for every component, you would run some kind of pipeline that would guess the part number and uh, search for documentation, for tools, etc. And in the end, you end up having this, what I call schematic reconstruction. Uh, of course, it's not the full schematic, but I think this is fine for us as an attacker because once we know that, you know, maybe this microcontroller talks to this radio over SPI, that's, um, that's the protocol or a signal that we can tamper with, that we can demand in the middle, you know, or it talks to a flash, and then we know, okay, we need to dump this flash and see what it stores. And, uh, it gives us a lot of options, and um, uh, especially in the first couple of weeks, I think uh, this is what we work with the most. And having confidence in this is essential um, for keeping the quality and, and also the motivation up. So how do you actually take pictures of PCBs? I think this is an important step. And remember, when you write a report or um, maybe an internal report or whatever, it's always good to include pictures and this is common practice, but um, many people actually don't know how to take proper pictures of um, PCBs. And if we want to do anything in an automated way, they need to be, they need to be spot on. Um, you yourself, yourself, you save yourself a lot of time if your pictures are good. So this is a bad example. Um, here, it's not fully disassembled. You still have subsystems attached. Um, there's bad lighting conditions. The background is a bit, you know, I, I wouldn't use it. Um, especially you can see this gradient of like yellowish light here and uh, shadows over here. That's not too optimal. And um, the things I'm going to mention here on how to improve this, how, how to actually take proper pictures, you, you really don't need expensive equipment. Like all of this can be done pretty much for free. Even smartphones nowadays have very good cameras. Um, so in order to take a good PCB picture like this one, um, you would properly clean the PCB. Uh, you can use alcohol or um, even brake cleaner, if that works as well, uh, or pressured air. I mean, you want to remove anything that could cover up the part numbers. That's what we're interested in. Um, any dust could interfere with, you know, whatever we do later. And uh, of course, you need to remove stickers as well. Um, you should use a long exposure time, simply, you know, because of two reasons. You should set the ISO really low so that we have little sensor noise and we can zoom in very wide, have smooth surfaces, if we want to have a smooth image. And because of that, you have to use a long exposure time, but also the long exposure time helps you to um, get the lightning just right so that you get rid of some of the shadows that that there are. And of course, you don't want to waste the resolution of your camera. You want to have the PCB as close as possible, covering as much of the image that you take. Because if, if you have like background on the sides, then uh, that, that, that's waste. You know, we have high resolution cameras, so we should make use of it. Um, now, our idea on how to identify chips on a PCB was actually very simple. Um, chips are rectangular continuous regions in the image and they're always similar in that way. So 
how do we actually tell a computer <clears throat> to look for you know rectangular uh, continuous regions in the image? And there are a couple of ways to do this, but the way we did it was that we use a color-based segmentation approach. Segmentation means that we assign regions to the image. Um, and in the end, the idea is to have regions that, to have to remove as much information as possible from the image so that only the chips remain, right? So first we do a bit of pre-processing, we blur a bit, we uh, remove high frequency image details. Uh, so if you, if you start with an image like this, uh, this would be a hard drive controller. Um, then you would start removing and then smoothing the image a little bit and afterwards it would look like this. And you can see that already the chips make up big portions of the image. Um, finally, and this is the most crucial step, you remove anything that basically doesn't look like a chip. So in this case, we have a green solder mask here, just get rid of that. And um, you filter every pixel by color volume. Um, this is very efficient. It's, it's a one-step procedure, and you end up with an image that looks somewhat like this. Um, you can see that the, that the areas of the chips stick out. So the only remaining step is to fit rectangles over these um, chip regions. You have to filter these by, by size. And there's more details on how this is implemented as well. But, um, you get the idea. We, we look for rectangles on the PCB and we end up finding the chips regions, um, which are the blue rectangles here on that image. Now, um, this works. We have evaluated that and refined it over the years. Um, this works really well. Um, <clears throat> here and there, uh, it will miss a few components, but even with black solder mask or anything, it's fine. And, it, it works well because it's not only very debuggable, you know, you know exactly what, what it's doing. It's very visual, um, but also um, it assumes that you have good conditions of the input image. I think that's the most crucial thing is that your lightning in every project is somewhat similar. Um, now, once we've identified components, we might have missed something or we actually do want to care about the passives. And there's a second approach that we do in order to solve that, which is template matching. So once we've identified a component like this little capacitor here, <clears throat> marked in red, we, we crop out that region and use it as a template to look for other instances of that component on the PCB. Um, basically, you compare that little template, you, you slide it over the image and then calculate a similarity metric with a template. And if it exceeds the threshold, you mark it as a hit and uh, this works extremely well. And uh, here indicated by the arrow, it's a also invariant to rotation, meaning that with a horizontal, horizontally aligned component, we can also detect uh, instances that are rotated, in this case, vertically aligned. Um, as a last step, you would have to remove some duplicates and overlaps. Um, basically, you need to there is a very simple way on how to do this. You could, pro for example, always pick the first match, which, which is usually going to be fine. Um, it doesn't need to be perfectly aligned with the component. Um, we, we don't really care about it that much because remember, in the end, we want to read part numbers. So as long as the part numbers are there, uh, we can, you know, the computer can do its job. Now, having these regions, we crop them out and uh, we perform kind of some kind of optical character recognition to get the part number. Um, again, there's, there's a couple of source tools to do it. Usually they don't work that well, um, and unless you modify them a bit, we usually recommend using cloud service for that. Um, and, and that's been detailed as well in some of the documentation. Um, however, the, the bigger challenge um, you know, the bigger challenge here is to know what actually is the path number, because um, it doesn't always, or it rarely ever is the case that you have a continuous string written on the, written on the component that, that's, that, um, that's the path number. So we have something like ARMB or, you know, EOCR algorithms out there. They, they will give you a lot of matches basically like this. So now you have to kind of decide what is the actual uh, component name. And um, that is 
solved by um, basically two approaches. So you would have a minimum character count to get rid of like noise, like dots, for example, will always get uh, detected quite easily by OCI. But then you would have some kind of database with part number um, matches or you know known part numbers from online catalogs of chips or uh, manufacturer naming patterns like from, for example the STM32 has a ton of variants which are all STM32F something 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 and um, then again you, you don't need um, you don't need a PhD to solve this problem it's it's very straightforward and now what you would say Ferdy this is nice but how do you actually deal with components that aren't labeled um, well, we've been struggling with that and there's a couple of solutions to this with, which I would like to share with you and I think are very interesting, even if you don't have, you know, an automated system um, that, that processes images. So in many cases, remember making a chip is expensive. So in many cases, OEMs go to the chip manufacturers and say, look, I, I need this part, but I need it in, I don't know, uh, some weird temperature range and uh, maybe, you know, maybe with parts availability guaranteed for 10 years and then they make a custom chip for that um, or, or some other features which might not actually be um, um, related to the silicon itself. Now for silicon features they do the same. Usually it's a reused design um, that they customize a little bit and then their packaging process, manufacturing process for the chip is essentially the same. Now these are the two first options, right? And another option is it's, um, it's just a standard chip where they scraped off the label because they don't want you to know what it is. Um, and then there's the third case, which is that the chip is entirely custom. Um, but for the first two cases, which I think make up a big share of what you'll actually see in systems, um, we're dealing with reused designs. So how can we spot these reused designs or these rebranded chips? Um, we could, and this is again where the automation comes in, uh, we could look at the chip dimensions, how big is the package, and um, also what's very easy to figure out for you as an analyst is um, seeing the supply paths, right? It's very easy to spot the ground pane, and once you know where they are and you, you know what package the chip is in, um, you could again <clears throat> look up in some kind of database um, what matches closely these characteristics of chip dimensions and supply paths. And this works uh, surprisingly well. <clears throat> now, what actually are the sources of information that we can get um, when we're testing systems? Um, the, the very first thing that you want to look at, of course, is the data sheet. And uh, yeah, some of this is quite obvious and I don't need to go into detail, but basically, we want to answer a couple of questions, meaning what does this component do? Um, what, do what do the individual pins do? And uh, are there any debugging ports? You know, uh, if, it's, if it's a microcontroller, we want to look straight for debugging interfaces or for what architecture this product is in. And uh, note, note these down. So this is also a little bit about figuring out which information we can ignore, right? because uh, you wouldn't necessarily care about how, how many timers does this chip have or, um, or how much current does it draw. You know? As an attacker, we want to know where the signal is. And um, well, to know where the signals are, you would look at pinout diagrams like this, which basically map pin names um, to, to pin locations. And in this case, this is a supply pin, pin one. Um, but you will also notice that these pin names are more like aliases. They don't mean anything. Well, the exception being the supply pins and maybe this reset pin. But PC0, we have no idea what it means. So uh, we need to take another step and match this name to something like this. And usually they have tables for this or some, some kind of software that lets you configure the individual pin functions. Um, and only there you can see which functions could this pin have. Like for example, PV10 would be um, a UI3 transmit. 
And this as an integral, of course, is something that you always do. So we want to make this as painless as possible. Um, another thing is that if you're handling VGA parts, usually you have your image on the left um, and, and you remove the VGA parts so you can probe the, the pads, right? And um, it can be a bit challenging to, to visually know where what is. So, um, in fact, many of the package diagrams, like you see here on the left, are in uh, some kind of table format <clears throat> in the PDF. So we can treat it as an image and extract that table so we get this nice list. And this is very easy for us to deal with. We don't want to deal with images. We want to deal with structured information. And this is what we just need. And so then you can overlay that on, on your uh, PCB image and fire away. Now, other sources of information, of course, are the technical reference manuals and IDEs. I'm, I'm calling these out in particular because uh, when we dump firmware, later on we want to have, this, we want to have signatures, uh, function signatures. We, uh, we want to have definitions of you know, types, structs, all of that. And um, someone who's designing the system needs to have that information, so it must be somewhere. Of course, um, some of this can be covered by an NDA or very, be very proprietary, but at least we can get some hints already by just automatically just scraping all of that and most importantly, matching um, the part number to tools that you can use. Uh, debuggers as well. What debugger do I need to dump the firmware? You know, these are questions that you can answer automatically. Now, there's some challenges with this, of course. Um, we, we have our part numbers, we know where the chips are, this is all very nice, but um, what we get is a bunch of PDFs. And um, yeah, many people say that you have to treat PDFs as images, but um, I think, um, you know, you can, you can do a lot of simple things that simplify um, your, your life a bit already, just by using the structured information that's in the PDF and by using open source tools. Um, so you would convert it to, couple, to a couple formats, you would convert the PDF to images, to text, to HTML, and that's something parsable, right? So then you can go on and define regex entries for table of contents entries. Um, this is something that we're doing and um, that, that you can see in, um, in the tool and the approach that we have. We, you simply define the list of keywords that you want to know. And really, as an analyst, this is what you do anyway. You open up the PDF, you control F, JTAG, and then you look for the information that you want. So again, this is about getting rid of the unnecessary information and focusing on what you care about. So this way already you can identify chapters in the PDF that are relevant and put them in folders to extract these chapters so you don't have to scroll through the document. That already saves some time. Again, we want to keep it simple. Um, and, and build, build up some kind of knowledge base and, um, and some framework in which we can repeat and refine our analysis. Of course, there's issues. You need to be very defensive in your coding. You need to assume that the PDFs can be very different. They can contain scanned images. They contain basically anything. And they can also be very huge. So the tooling for this, unfortunately, isn't, <clears throat> isn't all that great. Um, Again, um, it's about getting started. You, you start scraping data sheets, you put it in a folder or whatever, and then you match tags or you know, um, table of content names, you extract some information, and then from there on you refine. This is more of an iterative process. <clears throat> um, now let's talk about the other approaches a little bit. Um, you can combine it. Everything I um, talked about until now was more about things you can do essentially for free because taking images doesn't really take much time and pressing some buttons doesn't either. But um, if you do have to have a higher level of detail, of course, you will combine this with techniques such as delayering. And in delayering, <clears throat> you would first of remove all the components on a PCB and, and then um, what you're basically interested in is the netlist, like which pad connects to which other pad or 
which line of copper represent which net, right? What is connected? And from there on, you can abstract higher and say, okay, this connect, this component is mounted on this pad, and because of that, it's connected to this network. Um, if you cut a PCB and look at it from the side, it would look like this. You have your solder mask in green, in this case. Uh, you have exposed paths like this, and you have drills which are connected through like this. This is a four layer stack up, and we're interested in the copper layers because that's, that's our conducting element, right? That's, that's how the traces are formed, the connections between your components. So what you would do is you would, um, you would remove first the solder mask and any components that are on the top and you take an image. In the next step, um, you remove this plus the substrate that separates the copper layer from the other and take another image and you repeat this process until there are no, uh, no layers left. Um, this is something that I would consider um, doable, but again, in our opinion, you don't need it as much because um, many projects are simple and you care more about having, um, you know, you, you need to download data sheets anyway, and look at it. But if you have uh, very complex boards or very small boards that are hard to handle, this can be extremely useful. Another thing you can do is x-ray, of course, um, which um, if you have an x-ray machine, can be very um, nice. If you don't have an X-ray machine, of course, this this is just not doable. While delayering, you can use tools. You can use fiberglass brushes. And, you know, you can sort of homebrew that. But for an X-ray, it, it's fine. <laughs> you either have an X-ray machine or you don't. Um, but if you have one, of course, um, especially two-layer boards are very easy to reverse. And with this, you can also get a full necklace. Now we have experience in in delayering and with X-ray, and um, Usually we don't end up using it much, but um, just so you know, it's there. And there's also very, very um, sophisticated X-ray technologies that are not only two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. But again, the goal for these two methods is to get the netflix. Like it won't, it won't tell you part numbers, right? So it's, it's a bit different. Um, yeah, and then also what some people do is when they X-ray chips, you, you can see the silicon. Um, sticking out a bit here and you can see where it is, how it is bonded to the pins using the wires and that's also a way of how you could deal with um, calcium chips. Um, but again, your mileage may vary and this is a whole other topic. Um, also, there's um, flying probe tests. I know that some people are looking into this. Um, basically, any manufacturer for PCBs has one of these machines that just has these needles that um, that are positioned on the tap on, on the pads and they test connectivity between one pad and the other. So in a way, this is like um, a, a multimeter on steroids because we, you know they can measure component values as well, but it's automated, so you don't have to do it by hand. Uh, this is really nice, but again, you need to have some kind of equipment like this. Now, your question is probably where do I actually start? And uh, we can probably say that we will open source some of this. Um, basically, we have tools for chip detection, chip identification, and document, document handling and gathering. Um, anyway, the very first step is always getting your PCB stage set up. Just make some room and, and put some nice lighting or whatever, and start picking, pick, taking pictures of PCB. Because in the end, um, you will take the pictures anyway. So why not make them look nice? Um, you know, and you have to take them anyway for writing a report or you know, for memorizing if, if you take a vacation and then you come back. It's, it's always good to have that kind of documentation. Um, you can send me a message if you're interested in hearing about these tools. We follow the philosophy that one tool to do, should do one job, you know, just very well. So there's going to be many small tools that take care of the individual steps that I mentioned. Um, but also based on this and also the paper that we published about this, um, you, you could also start and do your own. And I'd, I'd love to hear about your experiences. Um, if any of you have maybe done this already, uh, it'd be quite interesting to be in touch. Now, um, this was my presentation on reversing PCBs and uh, you can follow me here on the socials and uh, I think this is the time where we take questions now.
Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, now it's the time for uh, Q&A. So please uh, send any questions that you have in the chat and uh, Ferdi will answer them right now. Let's give people a few minutes to type the question in. And you can uh, uh, open the chat and see if there is any questions that were sent to you privately. You can check as well. Can, yeah, okay. is it fine if I read the question? I think it is fine. Yeah, please read the question. Uh, and uh, you One can question from the group chat was, um, if you can create a netlist th this way without delay. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, in that case, you, you can uh, even, okay, there, there's basically two ways you can do it. You can probe every connection by hand or using a flying probe machine, you know, and then you know which paths connect because they always have to be on the two sides of the PCB, no matter how many layers the PCB has. They'll always terminate on the front or the back, so that way you can test it, and that way you get a netlist. And the other approach is to remove all the components and um, to, to look at the traces themselves. Um, this is this is something we've looked at as well as boards for two layer boards, right? And um, yeah, so, so those are two very cheap ways you, you can get the metals. Even though, again, many times you don't need the metals. Okay, there, there is another question um, from Roman. Is there an actual database where you can fetch many data sheets at once? <sighs> this, this is tough. Um, there are databases which index the data sheets, and I'm sure that you know them already. Um, I think a problem like this, and also for us academically or, or commercially or as a, as a community, it's hard to share data sheets because there's um, IP involved. And um, I think no one really wants to take the risk and, and um, publish something that they're not allowed to publish. So I think this is a big issue, um, even though that other types of information are aggregated in IDEs, for example, like they, they just give them to but unfortunately, I myself haven't found this one, um, this one site or, or company that gives you just everything. Let me know if you do, but <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. Okay, seems like we got all the questions. Uh, I guess uh, your presentation was already really detailed, so. <laughs> You answered all possible questions in your presentation. So thank you again for joining us for this webinar. And uh, we hope to see you again at the Hardware IO soon.